steps on a ladder because we're all, every soul is in a different stage of his or her evolution. We're all growing. So gradually, by taking up one of the practices of yoga, one matures and goes to the next step, the next step. But where is all leading to? Where is it going? To bhakti, the yoga of love, the meaning of life, the purpose of life, the only thing that makes us want to be alive and get out of bed in the morning is love. But the love of this world is conditional. Yes, I love you, but this is my list of terms and conditions. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm afraid you have to cancel this love contract. The problem is that love has no terms and conditions. And that love can only exist between our soul, which is eternal, because love is eternal, forever, it can never be broken. Between our soul and the Supreme Soul, from whom all existence has come. So, yogi nam visarvesham madgate nantrapana Shadavan Bajate Yoma Same Yukta Tamo Mataha. So for those who's, for whom Sanskrit is not their first language, then the translation is that out of all the different kinds of yogis, the one who is serving Krishna is saying, 
Supreme Lord is like the one who is serving me with love in his heart. He is the best of all. Now, in our ancient tradition, it's a Vedanta, Vedanta tradition. And in Vedanta, a person has to study the six classical philosophical systems of India. Nyai, logic, Vaisheshik, atomic theory, Sankhya, metaphysics, yoga, the yoga sutras of Patanjali, Karmakanda, that means performing five sacrifices, ritualistic performances, and last Vedanta. So it said that the, the seat, the seat of the Guru is called Vyasasana. And no one should sit on the seat of the Guru unless they are experts in all the six classical systems of philosophy and ways of life of ancient India so that they can compare and contrast and come to the conclusion of Bhakti Pure Love. So it's part of our tradition because we're a Vedanta tradition. One part is to study the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali. <coughs> so, oh please raise your hand if you're a little familiar with the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali. So, read something. Okay. So we'll just touch on a few ideas. First of all, in the first sutra, he's saying, Atta Yoga and Shashana. Now, the Shashana, the teaching of Yoga. But not Yoga Shashana, Yoga Anu Shashana. Anu means, Patanjali is saying, I did not make this stuff up myself. I didn't make it up myself. I have received it from my Guru. Anu means following. I received it from my Guru, he received it from his Guru, from a line of realized masters. Because if a teacher hasn't realized, doesn't have the experience of what he's speaking about, it will have no effect on the students. They'll get some information, some details that they can repeat like a parrot or a recorder. But they will not have any realization unless Guru has a realization. So Patanjali is saying, now the teaching which is coming from the realization of ancient masters. And the first thing he does is define the project of yoga. Hmm? Yoga, second sutra. Yoga chitta vritti nirodaha. Yoga is defined as the complete restraint of all the psychological fluctuations. You see, you don't see the world directly. You see it through the filter of your own chitta, your own mind, your psychic body, your astral body, through that filter. So, let's say, if there's a, a lake of water, if it's very still, then when you look, you can see your own reflection there clearly. But if the surface of the water is oscillating, then when you look, everything is distorted. So Patanjali is saying that if our mind is not perfectly still and perfectly steady, in the state of yoga, it's synonymous with the word samadhi, trance. Unless one goes into the state of perfect samadhi trance, you don't see reality as it is, but you see a distorted picture of reality. So what is the nature of that distortion? Go to the next sutra. What's the next sutra? Tada drastuhu surupavastanam When our mind is perfectly still in yoga, in samadhi, in trance, tada, it's at that time. Drastuhu, the seer, is situated in his own swarup, that means in his true nature. 
Hmm? I'm looking at you, but I don't see you. I see your eyes. But behind your eyes, there is you. Atta, the soul, eternal, transcendental, spiritual, part of God. Just like when the sun shines, millions of photons emanate from the sun. So from God, who is like the sun, millions of photons, spiritual photons have emanated. And that's us. That's who you are. A particle, like a photon of spiritual energy of God. So this is described in the mother of all Vedic mantras, Veda Mata. Veda Mata means the mother of all Vedic mantras. Do you know that mantra? Om Bhur Bhuvahasva Tat Savitu Varhanyam Vargo Devasya The guy actually, the guy. Yeah, I don't say the whole mantra. Otherwise, that I'd be initiating him will be my disciples. <laughs> So it's Kali, in Kali, we sometimes Gurus make disciples by force. <laughs> but that's actually not the Vedic way. The Vedic way, the disciple comes on his knees with tears of, please, please accept me. And Guru says, mm, maybe. <laughs> Come back later. <laughs> Check for it. Testing. The Vedas say, if the disciple is not tested before being accepted, causes a ruination of the world. The untested disciple brings about the ruination of the world. So anyway, I'm not going to say the whole matter. <laughs> By force. So, but the Brahma Gayatri is saying what? Bargo Devasya Dhimahi. We, the many, many souls, Dhimahi is in the plural, so there's many of us. We meditate. Bargo Devasya on the beautiful energies of God. So God is one and the souls are many. Don't think that I am God and you are God. We are all God. And I am you and you are me. And I am the walrus. <laughs> this, this is not spiritual realization. This is just like a confusion that comes about from smoking pot. <laughs> so the Vedas teach us that God is like the spiritual sun and we are the individual particles of spiritual energy. This is better than being God. Do you know why? Because though we are very tiny, if we can develop pure love, then that Supreme Lord who is the controller of all existence, tears come in his eyes and he bows down to us and says, how can I serve you? You become the master of God. Though you are very small, and that is the impossible power of love. That's the essence of yoga, actually. It's very, very high, but we can attain it in our life. It's a very exciting prospect. Hmm? Are you feeling some excitement? <laughs> I am. I am. <laughs> okay. Coming back to the Sutras of Patanjali, I have to be careful I don't want to go over time. I always go over by like three hours. <laughs> There's probably someone else coming. So, Patanjali says, Tadana Trastu Surupavastana, that when our mind is perfectly steady, then the soul, which is seeing the world reflected through the mind, realizes I'm not this mind, I'm the soul, I'm a spiritual being. So he's situated in his real nature, you see. When you're in your element, you're happy. If you take a fish out of the water, then what? He's just suffering. Ah, flap it like this, yes. Say, oh, Mr. Fish, what's the problem? Hmm? Are you too hot? I'll turn on the AC. <laughs> But he's still in anxiety. Hmm? What do you want? Pina colada? No. Hmm? Need an iPhone? A Lamborghini? What do you want? 
What do you want? Whatever he has, unhappy, disturbed. When he's back in his elements, in the water, then ah, completely happy. Raise your hand if in your life you have some anxiety. <laughs> Raise your hand if you experience sometimes from time to time problems. Okay. It's a clue that that fish is you. <laughs> and you're not in your element. Because we're spiritual by nature, but we're in the material atmosphere. So because we're out of our element, this is why we experience problems and anxiety and the, the bitter struggle for existence. And then we grow old and become full of diseases and at the grand finale, round rounds up the head. We die. And then we take birth again and go through the whole thing again. And again. And again. And again. And again. Until we meet the Guru. Then the Guru will tell us, Oh, why are you suffering here? This is not your home. Hmm? We are refugees. Refugee has no fixed place to stay. You go somewhere and they kick him out. You go somewhere else and kick him out. So in the same way, our soul has come into this body for a few years, then time will kick us out. Then we have another body. And again, we kick out again and again. Because the mature atmosphere is not our home. Our home is the transcendental realm. And it can be realized right now. You don't have to die and then find out whether it's true or not. Huh? Like, yes, when I die, then I'll find out the truth about God. Which religion was right? Was it the Buddhists? Was it the Jehovah's Witnesses? Was it the Catholics or the Jews? Hmm? I bought my raffle ticket. Yeah. And now death comes. Oh, I got the wrong ticket. No. Spiritual life is not a luxury. A gamble. No. In this life, just now, simply by going into the state of yoga, into samadhi, into trance, we can realize that divine realm in this life. And then when this body falls away, you're already there. So that state is called the Siddhi, perfection. Uh, Siddha Yogi, perfect Yogi, realizes the divine realm in this life, in their meditation. So, Tada Drastu Sorupavastanam when our consciousness is clean, clear and pure and still, we can see, I am soul. But, then next sutra, in the next sutra, Patanjali said, Sorupa vrityam itaratra, sorry, vritti sorupam itaratra. The meaning is, but, if you are not in the state of yoga, in the state of trance, samadhi, then your mind is oscillating. They're called the vrittis, chitta vritti, the turning, the churning, the whirlpools of your psychic body. All of your thoughts and feelings and conceptions, they're just vibrations, vrittis, in the psychic body. So if the mind is not still and the vrittis are moving, then Itaratra Vritisrupam, you identify with them. So your Vritis are moving in your mind and they say, I am this body. We feel like this body is me. I am male or female, young or old, black or white, healthy or sick, wealthy or poor, educated or utterly stupid. Whatever, whatever this body is, when the mind is oscillating, we think it's me. But no, we are absolutely not this body. 
And you can think your way out of it, just say, I'm not the body, I'm not this body, I'm not this, but you still feel like you're the body. You actually have to practice yoga. Because remember, the second sutra, yoga's chitta vritti niroda. Yoga is any method, there are different methods, but it's any methods by which these vrittis, niroda, become restrained and stop. So that you can realize practically, who am I? So, how can we do it? Patanjali himself gives many different mm, techniques. But among the young and neon, the last neon, he says, Ishwara Pranidhan. Ishwara Pranidhan means the spirit of Pranidhan surrender to Ishwara. Ishwara means the controller, God, the controller of everything. Who is that Ishwara? Karma, Klesha, Vipak, Ashaya, Aparin, Mishta. Purusha, Vishesh, Ishwara. This is a sutra from the Samadhi Pada, the first chapter on the trends. Patanjali is saying, that Ishwara is a Purush, that means a person. God is not impersonal, just like an energy, that's just some energy that's everywhere. Monotonous, without variety. But the source of all existence is more than everything. In this world, there is beauty, there is music, there is dance, there is artistry. There is drama, there is adventure, there is romance, everything here. That means that the Supreme Lord is more beautiful, more artistic, more romantic, more colorful, and can dance better than everyone. You know the German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche? He said, God is dead. But he said, also said, because he was wrong, because when Nietzsche said God is dead, then God said, no, nah, Nietzsche is dead. <laughs> but anyway, he said, he said something that really makes sense. He said, I could never worship a God who doesn't know how to dance. And I agree with him on that. So the supreme form of the highest consciousness in Sanskrit is called Krishna. And he's famous for dancing. He's famous for romance. He's famous for welcoming everyone so lovingly into his eternal divine plane. So Patanjali is giving some hint here that the ultimate reality, Purush, is a person. You could say, well, I'm also a Purush, so maybe it's me. He said, no, 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 no. Klesha Karma Vipahakashaya. This person was never touched. Aparimrishta. He was never touched by karma. We've definitely been touched by karma, right? Yeah. Yeah. So we can. Because sometimes people study the sutras of Patanjali, they get confused and they think it's promoting something impersonal or whatever. But it's very, very personal. So Patanjali said, there's a person. It's not you. There's a transcendental person who was never touched by karma. And you can. The fastest way to enter into samadhi is to surrender, the spirit of surrender towards the Supreme Person. So Ishvara Pranidhana by surrender. Now, Patanjali had a disciple named Vyas and he wrote commentary on the Patanjali's Yoga Sutras. And that commentary is so deep and so perfect and brings out all the nuances of every sutra that in the traditional system, you never study the Sutra Patanjali by itself, but always with what is called the Vyas Basya, the commentary of his disciple Vyas. It's not Veda Vyas, it's another person, but it's, it has that name. So, so in the Vyas Basya, it is said there the meaning of Ishwar Pranidhan surrendering to the Supreme Conscious Person is Vishesh Bhakti. In Vishesh means intense devotion. 
intense devotion. That is the method to go into Samadhi and become enlightened. According to Patanjali. I agree with him. And all our great saints agree with him on this subject. So, now, one may ask Patanjali, Oh Maharaj, please tell me, I want to learn how to do Vishesh Bhakti, intense devotion, and enter into a trance. In your opinion, what's the best way? So then Patanjali gives the answer. He says, Tasya Chaka Pranavaha. That Supreme Consciousness is denoted by Pranava. Pranava is the syllable. Om. Ah, ooh, mm. three letters. Aum. So he said that that's the bus that art bhavano. You should repeat this name of God. Oh. And art bhavano means meditate on the meaning. So we have been discussing the meaning of Ishwar, the Supreme Consciousness, who we are, our relation. So repeating that mantra and meditating on the meaning, gradually, gradually, you go into trance. There are different levels of trance, you know. Sampragyata Samadhi, Asampragyata Samadhi. Sampragyata Samadhi has Six levels. Savitarka, Nirvitarka, Savicha, Nirvicha, Sananda and Sasmi. So there are different levels of trance. If you come to our seminars and our retreats or visit our ashram in India, you can learn about the different levels of trance and the amazing experience that comes in each level. It's very fascinating. But I want to just move on a little bit from you. Yes. Can I ask a question? Yes, you're welcome. Um, this is like a controversial question, and I'm sorry to ask the, this question. Don't be shy. What is in your heart, just put it on the table, and you'll feel much better. Um, it's not shy, it's respectful. Is, so, is why I'm prefacing it. Shy isn't. What, that's not one of the. I'm not really that shy. Um, but respectful is what I want to be because I, I clearly you're a Hare Krishna. <laughs> um, but Ishwara uh, Pranidana does does that that does mean God consciousness. However, uh, that. At what point does it say Krishna? It, in the sutras, it, it doesn't say Krishna. I see yeah. points are, a lot of the points are going that direction. Mm -hmm. And then... That's why I said it's just like a hint. It's a hint, but, but I, were, I would... Uh, uh, do, yeah. Okay. Let me hear it. I understand your and question. Then, and then moreover, then there's the phone. Yes. Right, so... so mm, Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva, perhaps the Trinity, mm -hmm. but or maybe just God, maybe just the, the yeah the the coming out of uh, I I know the story and and the first sound ever uttered a uh, uh, sound of harmony perhaps but and, and Krishna is the sound of harmony. Okay, I get the question. Everyone follows the question in the sutras. Where it's describing the pranava is, is the sound vibration of God Himself. The sound is God Himself appearing in the form of a vibration. So in the commentary there, Vyas, the disciple of Patanjali, who's learned everything directly from Patanjali, 
he says that this is one name of God. And for other names of God, you can look at the Vedas, at the Puranas, at the Bhagavad Gita, and so on. So there, if you go to the source materials, there, the many names of God are given. So there are many avatars, incarnations of God, like Narayan, like Ram, Sita Ram, Lakshmi Narayan, like this. But the Vedas explain that the original form is Krishna, and all the avatars are coming from him. Ram comes from him, Narayan comes from him, and so on. So potentially say, any name of God, it will do, but that will lead you to have a relationship with that particular avatar. And there's a sutra about that. You can see uh, in the description of the neons, there is one of the neons is called Swadhyay. So Swadhyay means two things. Swa Adhyay. Swa means yourself and Adhyay means studying. So studying yourself. How do you study and come to know about yourself? By Japa, repetition of mantra. Like you thought, I'm in control of my life. I make my own choices. I control my own mind. Then you sit down to Japa meditate and you can because your mind is going everywhere. It's going to your dog, it's going to your Facebook, it's going to your shoes, it's going all over the place. Then you realize, wait, I've just learned something about myself that I can't control my mind. And my mind is, is actually superimposing all my life choices onto my soul. And that's why I make again and again choices that turn out perhaps not in the best way. You see? So Swadhyay means to study yourself. And Swadhyay also means to study the Vedic literatures, Veda, Upanishad, Purana, Yoga Sutras and different Sutras and so on. So, potentially describes what is the result, because each one of the five yamas and each one of the five niyamas produces some effect. So he said that the effect of Swadhyay, doing japa of one name of God, and studying the scriptures under the guidance of a guru, the, re the result is Ishtadeva Samyog. Ishtadeva Samyog. You remember this sutra? Samyog means meeting with your Ishtadev. Now, Dev means God, and Ishta means like beloved. In other words, though God has many forms, if there's one form whose mantra you are chanting, that form becomes your Ishtadev. You see? So, yeah, I'm not being sectarian. If you want to chant the, the Ram's name, the name of Ram, Sita Ram, Sita Ram, Sita Ram, Jaya Sita Ram, Sita Ram, Sita Ram, Sita Ram, Then you develop a love like Hanuman. You know Hanuman? <laughs> because he loves Ram. Otherwise, you can chant. Sri Manarayana Narayana 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 you know, like that. So God is only one. But he's seen in different ways, depending how much Shakti is manifesting. Just like, if you look at the moon, yesterday was Astami, the eighth day of the moon. Right? So if you looked in the sky, what did you see? Half moon. You see a half moon. But tomorrow you'll see a little bit more. The next day you'll see a little bit more. So there are 15 days in the, in the lunar cycle. So in the same way, the moon is one. There's only one moon. But you see different degrees of its effulgence. So in the same way, God is one. But depending on how much of his Shakti is manifesting, 
then you may see him as Narayan. You may see him as Ram. Or when the moon is full, that is Krishna Chandra. Krishna is called the Chandra means Krishna Chandra. That is the full moon. So there's not there are not many gods, there's only one God. But each person will discover that they have a loving relationship with one particular form. And that form is just right for that person. Hmm? Like Hanuman. I don't tell Hanuman to sing Krishna. Because he loves Ram, you sing Ram. No problem. Like that. So each and every one of us has a relationship with one form of the Supreme Reality. So when we come to a Guru and we start to practice, after some time, the Guru will give us a mantra which corresponds to whom is the object of our eternal love. Like this. Is it clear? Yeah. So, I used to live in a cave in a forest called Lahavan. It's just the other side of the river Jumuna from Mathura. And it is the birthplace of Patanjali. So I lived there. Just nearby is his father's ashram, Atrivishi. His father's Atrivishi. So I have a close relation with Patanjali, spiritually. When the sages write something, they write in quite cryptic language that has not one meaning, but it's like a zip file. If you can click on it, go, and so many meanings come out. <laughs> okay. So, where were we? Now, I've, so far I've spoken about yoga as expressed by Patanjali and how one can attain the perfection of trance by devotion to God and it's brought about by the japa, repetition of the holy name, whichever form of God is your Ishta, the one that you love. But quite frankly, I tell you, Krishna is most lovable. He's so lovable. Very, very sweet. Mm. <laughs> That's why his name is Krishna. You know, Krish means attractive, beautiful. And Nama means Ananda, joy. So that person who is the total embodiment of the totality of all beauty and all joy is called Krishna. You know that most of the languages of the world are based on Sanskrit. Sanskrit is the mother language. Sanskrit is the mother language. English, French, Russian, Lithuanian, Italian, Spanish, everything. They all come from Sanskrit. Latin, Greek, they all come from Sanskrit. So there's one word which is the same in every language. If you open the Oxford English Dictionary and you read the definition that says compelling beauty, compelling beauty, that inspires devotion. This is the test. That's the definition in Oxford English Dictionary. Compelling beauty that inspires devotion. What is that English word? And does matter what language you speak, in your language it will also be the same. I'll give you five seconds to guess. Five, four, three, two, one. <coughs> okay. So the answer is you you could have won a thousand dollars then. But it, anyway. The word is charisma. The word charisma is the same in Latin, in Greek, in Italian, in Spanish, in Russian, in English, and it means impelling beauty that inspires devotion. And the root of charisma is Krishna. That's where it comes from. <laughs> it's just like a wave crashing in the ocean of sweetness. Krishna. 
If I faint, this throws some water on me. <laughs> now, moving on from the Patanjali's um, Yoga Sutra, let's hear something from a very ancient Purana called the Bhagavad Purana. Because there also a definition of yoga has been given that is fascinating. There's a history. There's the first living being in the universe. His name is Brahma. Brahma, right? The creator. Actually, he's not God. He's not the supreme God. He is a soul like us. But he did so much good karma in his previous lives that when the cycle of the universe ended and the universe was destroyed, when it was created again, by his karma, instead of being born in Florida, <laughs> or like Korea, or China, or London, or Nigeria, right? Nigeria? Yeah, yeah. So instead of being born in these places, one soul who did so much good karma, he gets born as the first person in the universe on the highest planet, Brahalok. And he's entrusted to do the secondary creation he creates through his meditation. So he's very high, but it's called Brahma. And he has some disciples. He's a great guru. And he has four disciples. They're called the four Kumaras. They're great sages, but they, by their yoga power, they keep themselves young like little boys. You know? If you have yoga city, you can stay looking very young. Yeah. Especially if you practice bhakti yoga, you can stay more young. Yeah. Better than Botox. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 84. <laughs> I'll show you my passport. <laughs> so, there are four boys, four Kumaras, and they are the disciples of Brahma. So one day, the four disciples of Brahma came to their guru and father, and they bowed down to him. Jai Guru Dev. They said, we have a question. This is our question. The mind is naturally attracted to sense objects, right? The mind just, it just goes there. Do you ever feel like you need some chocolate? <laughs> yeah, okay. So the mind just goes after things all the time. And at the same time, it's the nature of the sense objects that they make impressions that stay in your mind. So there's this natural mutual relationship between the mind and the things of the material world that like we become attached to and which make obstacles in our spiritual advancement. Hmm? So the Fukumar said, Oh Gurudev, please tell us, if the mind is naturally attracted to the objects of the world and the objects naturally leaves impressions in the mind, then how is it possible to attain the perfection of yoga by detaching the mind from the external sense objects? So then Brahma, he heard this question and he thought, and he was trying to think of the answer, but he just could not come up with the answer. And the reason was, he'd been doing some creation, and creation is the energy of Rajas, you know? Sattva, Rajas, Tamas. Tamas is destruction, ignorance. A rajas is creative power, passion. And sattva is goodness, the balance between them. So because Brahma had touched the rajas, the passion, so his mind was not perfectly steady. And because of this, he could not understand how to answer the question. See, all knowledge comes from a pure consciousness. But his consciousness at that moment was not fully pure. He couldn't think of the answer. So just while he was thinking of the answer, suddenly, there was a blazing light, brighter than a million suns, but very cooling like a million moons. And they looked into that light, and in the middle of that light, they saw 
a beautiful swan. A perfect, charming, attractive, beautiful swan. And they thought, who is this? We should give respect to this great person. And Baba and his four disciples, they all bowed down and they gave Pranam. And they said, who are you? Now, these four disciples, they were thinking, oh, the spirit is just one. There's no variety. They were thinking like that. And this one had a sense of humor. So those one said, why are you asking who are you? If everything is one, then your words make no sense. Who are you talking to? Do you have like multiple personality disorder? Right? If the only thing that exists is one thing, and it's you, then who are you talking to? So the swan was very funny, because it was an incarnation of God. Krishna has many avatars, and this is called the Hamsa avatar. The swan incarnation of Krishna. So he was not open about everything, he's just joking with them, because God is so funny. You know, where do you think comedy comes from? Yeah? Where does comedy come? It doesn't come from Saturday Night Live. Right? It comes from God. Hmm? So he said, hmm? just like teasing them a little bit, why oh, do you think everything's one? Why are you asking this question? Do you have multiple personality disorder? Hmm? He said, look, if you think that there's only spirit and it's one, your question makes no sense. And if you don't believe in spirit, you only believe in matter, like atheist, like a materialist, then you should say, who are you five? Not who are you one, who are you five? Because if everything is, is matter, then whatever I am is just five material elements, earth, water, fire, air and space. So in this way, Hans Arta was teasing them. But he knew their question, and that's why he appeared to answer that question. So he said, look, before I answer this question, who am I? First, try to understand who are you? Because very often people get ahead of themselves. They're all arguing with each other about God, what God is like but they don't even know themselves. Because if they knew themselves, they would be arguing. They would be very peaceful and respectful for every, to everyone. So don't get ahead of yourself. First try to know thyself. After that, the higher questions can come. We can run before we can walk. So he said this, Jagra Swapa Shashuttancha Guna to buddhi vrittayaha Tasam vilakshano jivaha Shakshitvena vinishchita It means that there are three states of consciousness being awake like now you're awake in the waking state of consciousness then you fall asleep and you dream so there's the dream state of consciousness and then you go into shushukti, deep sleep. Hmm? So each one of us is just oscillating from being awake to dreaming to deep sleep, back to dreaming, back to deep sleep. We go between those two a few times every night and then we come back to awake, being awake again. So he said, these three states come from the three energies of matter, sattva, rajas and tamas. When sattva, the energy of balance, becomes prominent, you wake up. When rajas, passion, becomes prominent, you go into a dream state. And when tamas, darkness, becomes prominent, you go into deep sleep. Now, when you're awake, you feel like you're this body, physical body. But when you dream, then your body is just lying on the bed, like that, kind of, you know, dribbling on the pillow. <laughs> Hmm? Just lying there. But what are you doing? All kinds of things. Right? You're running around here and there. Hmm? 
Who, whoever went to work in their dream? Have you ever had a dream that you went to work? Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right, exactly. But the question is this. Did you get paid for that overtime? No, then why did you go? You didn't. You didn't go because you didn't know you were dreaming. Because if you knew you were dreaming, you said, oh, I'll take the day off. I'm not going. I'm not get paid for this. Right? So it's amazing. It's amazing. When we are awake, we are totally convinced that we're this body. Our ego is so strong. Completely. This is me. If anyone will insult us, we'll become furious. Where's my pattern bomb? <laughs> This, we want to take revenge. This is our ego. Huh? We so, but then when you dream, you forget this body. You don't totally be detached from the body. But you have a body in your dream. But now you're totally convinced that you're this body. <laughs> so just like the first level was an illusion, this level that you're in right now, illusion. Sorry. <laughs> But you have to wake up. Can you hear your alarm clock going off? You know what the alarm clock is? Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama. This vibration is not from this world, it comes from the divine realm. Through the Guru and comes to our ear and starts to wake up our soul. So now we're in illusion when we go into a dream. Now we're also completely in illusion, running around, doing things. And then we go into deep sleep. In deep sleep, you forget your psychic body, even. Your mental body, you forget in deep sleep. So the Hansa Avatar said, you should know yourself by knowing that you are Sakshi. Sakshi means the witness. You are not the physical body, you are not the psychic body, and you are not the darkness of deep sleep, but you are the soul who is the witness of the changing states. The states are always changing, but you remain the same. That's who you are. Hmm? Then, huh? just digest that for a moment, chew it a little bit. Ah, swallow it and feel nourished. Hmm? Can you feel the nourishment? It's powerful. This is called Tattva the knowledge of the principles of reality. It's nourishing for our soul. Hmm? So then, the Hansa Avatar said the most shocking thing. He said, that's you, the Sakshi, the witness. Hmm? And everything else is me. <laughs> ah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Huh? That's the joke. That's why you can laugh. But that's the joke. Huh? That's the trick of Maya. God is everywhere. Huh? But we don't see because of our ego. And we project our own ego onto others. You have an ego, you have an ego. Everything is mature everywhere. But behind everything is the smiling face of the Supreme Lord. So first we should know ourselves. By going beyond Sattva, Rajas and Tamas, going beyond waking, dreaming and deep sleep. Hmm? Now, Hansa Avatar is ready to give the answer to the original question. Hmm? Who remembers what was the original question that was confusing them? No, that's what they said to him when he arrived. Why did he come? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The question was, if the mind naturally is going towards the sense objects and the sense objects are naturally entering into the mind and leaving impressions there, how can I attain the perfection of yoga by detaching the mind from the external world and the external sense objects? That was the question. Okay? Now, Hans Avatar said, now you know who you are and you know who I am. Now I'll answer that question. He said, the perfection, listen, careful. <laughs> the perfection.
function of yoga is not to detach the mind from the external sense objects, but the perfection of yoga is to detach you from your mind. I just say one more time. The perfection of yoga is not to detach your mind in all these riches, this psychological body that's always moving from the external sense objects, but the, the perfection of yoga is to detach you, Atma, the soul, the witness, from your mind. You see? That's the perfection of yoga. So how can you deliver your consciousness of your soul from its infatuation and absorption with all this mental static, you know? All this mental weather going on. One day you wake up and, you know, your mental sun is shining and it's all good. Another day you have mental rain. You know, the weather's changing inside. Happiness and distress. Feeling inspired, feeling discouraged or depressed. Right? That's not you. So how do we de become delivered, the soul delivered from the mind? So the word for mind in Sanskrit is man. Yeah, man. English word mind comes from Sanskrit man. And if you want to go somewhere, you have to go by some means of transport. Right? Some type of transport. Well, guess what the word transport comes from? Triate, transport. So mantra, that by which the self is transported away from the mind is mantra. Mantra. Mm -hmm. Now, let me just check that it's still Tuesday. Okay. <laughs> Are we all still on the same page? Yeah. We're on a journey together today. Just stay on the train until we arrive. Okay. So, mantra. When we sit to remember mantra, then you should be very still and have good posture. Because if you don't have good posture, if you're kind of leaning here and there, you'll get aches and pains. The spine is designed to be straight like this, self-supporting. So when you lose consciousness of your body, you won't fall over. Right? So this human body is very nice, it was designed for meditation. So sit up very straight. This is described in chapter 6 of Bhagavad Gita. And it's very good, it's not absolutely necessary all times, but to keep track of how you're progressing, how you're in slowly increasing your meditation. The, all the great sages, they have, you can see Lord Shiva, whenever you see Lord Shiva, he always has a mala, a japa mala, right? Some meditation beads. And so you can keep count of how many mantras you have done and increase a thousand, two thousand, sixteen thousand, hundred. 100,000. That's, that's why on the Mahas we have like these bits here. Every time we do, um, actually, when we do 25,000, that means all the bits are down. Then you put them up again, you do another 25,000, put them up again. So, anyway. so you sit in a good posture. And then just invite the mantra to appear in your consciousness. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Now, or raise your hand if you're a feminist. Or not, which generation? First generation? Second generation? Third generation? Okay, no harm. Will you not listen? Men and women are different, we both are great. Mm. So the thing is this, that someone may say, but this Krishna is a man. <laughs> so in this mantra, Hare is the female aspect of God, the Shakti. Krishna cannot do anything without his Shakti, the female aspect. That is, her name is Radha. And when she's called, 
Radha, it becomes Radhe. So her name is also Hara. Hara means she steals the heart of Krishna. So Hara in the concrete case becomes Hare. So this mantra is the female aspect of the supreme reality and the male aspect and especially the love between them. It's the embodiment between the love between God and His female energy, Hari. So we meditate on this mantra. Now there's a secret to sound. The secret to sound is this: that sound has four levels. The part that you can hear, the part that you can record, like you're all recording. This is only the superficial level. Hmm? called Vaikari. So I want to describe how sound appears. It starts off as a movement of pran in your Mul Adar Chakra. The lowest chakra is called Mul Adar and pran is situated in there and it's always moving. Sometimes it goes to the left, sometimes to the right, sometimes in Ida, sometimes in Pengala. So, and this makes the, also the, this movement makes our activities oscillation of the mind because the prana is not in the center. It's going sometimes in Ida, sometimes in Pingala. So, when we chant mantra, it brings the prana in the center. Then your mind becomes steady, something. So it starts, the first level is called para and it's on the level of prana and it rises up. Hmm? The Shushumna Nadi to the Manipurak Chakra. At that stage, sound is manifesting more and it's called Pasyanti. And there, Prana, now in that stage, the vibration is beginning to take control of your mind. And then the vibration comes up to the Anahata Chakra. So Pran, Manas, then Buddhi. The sound at that stage is called Madhyama. So Para, Pasyanti, Madhyama. Then it comes up to the Vishuddhi Chakra. And from there it comes out of your mouth. And that's the bit that you can hear. It's called Vaikari. So four levels of sound, Para, Pasyanti, Madhyama and Vaikari. So when you say a mantra, it's not actually, when it comes out of your mouth, that's not the start of it. It's starting there and it's going through the mental and intellectual stages even before it comes out from your mouth. And this is how the vibration takes control of your mind. Remember Patanjali's definition? Yoga Chitta Vritti Nirodaha. We want to control those fluctuations. So when you begin to say the mantra, it begins to control the mental and intellectual platform before it even comes out of your mouth. Now, some people like to do silent meditation. But in order to produce a sound, you require a stronger movement of prana. So it's better to actually articulate the mantra because then the prana will move more strongly as it's going through the mental and intellectual stages. It will have a stronger effect. But it has another effect. What is that? When it comes out of your mouth in an actual sound, it goes into your ears and then it goes back in. And the sound, goes, just like I'm talking to you now, the only reason you understand what I'm saying is because the vibration goes in your ear and then goes through your mental and intellectual channels and is deciphered into its meaning there. You see? So sound on the way out and sound on the way in controls the psychic body. And this is how the mantra is beginning to bring us towards the state of yoga. Understand? So, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. All the other bridges are disappearing and only the mind is focused on God. Now, 
Thus far, it was kind of a mechanical effort. But when the Supreme Lord hears you calling his name with love, then he said, oh, I'm coming. And then God himself, in the form of Aprakrita Prana, that means supernatural spiritual prana. You have a prana, but it's material, it's, it's not transcendental. It's a very fine, subtle material energy. So, but when you are offering yourself to God, oh, I am your servant, how can I please you? And when you serve Guru, the spiritual master who is very dear to the Supreme Lord, you know, if you're walking in the street, you meet some stranger who's walking his dog, and you just go, wow, nice doggy, and pat the dog. That stranger immediately loves you, right? because you love his dog. Right? So in the same way, Guru is like very dear, he's very dear to God. So when you come and you serve the Guru, then God says, oh, he likes my devotee. Then God likes you. So two things are there, serving a saint, find a very enlightened, pure saint and serve him. Receive mantra and chant mantra every day by these two. Prabhu Kohe Vaishnav Seva Nama Sankirtan Dui Karoshi Prabhavi Sri Krishna Chana Serving the saints and vibrating the mantra very easily Krishna comes to us as our beloved friend. So as you are doing, making this vibration of mantra, then Supreme Lord in the form of Aprakita Pran will enter and mix with your Pran and take over. Because hmm? it's very difficult to control the mind. But if Krishna will come in the form of Aprakita Pran, he will come and control it for you. Hmm? Which, I mean, what can we control? We can't even control our children or Everything in our life goes out of control, and especially our mind, right? So when we chant the holy names, then that person who's controlling the whole universe says, don't sweat, I'll do, I'll help you. And the Aprakita Brahm comes and controls our mind. And this is why Patanjali says, the best, the quickest, and the fastest way to get Samadhi is Ishvara Panida, the devotion to God. Because either you can go the hard way, where you try to do it all yourself, or you can go the easy way, where Ishwara, Supreme Lord, just comes and controls your mind for you. Right? What do you want to do? The first way will take about 10,000 years. And the other way, maybe today. You could go into Samadhi, really, if we really surrender fully. So, there are some obstacles that come on the path of a Japa meditation. And um, after practicing myself for many years, and also teaching for many years, from my experience, my own experience and from seeing others, then I saw that there's a number of things that beginners, everyone, they do wrong. And they don't know. And they can't get out of the bad habits. And sometimes they practice for many years and they're still doing the same things wrong. And it's really holding them back. So, I made a list of these, like, the check mark of the problems. So, there are 15. The first one is the, when you sit down to meditate, you remain in a state of preoccupation with mundane things. Yeah. So you try to meditate, but your mind is going, oh, do I have to get the vaccine or not? And, you know, whatever's going on is coming in the mind. Huh? So it's called preoccupation with mundane things. Next one, the absence of introspection. That we're kind of just going along with whatever our mind's doing instead of detaching ourselves and watching the mind 
from an objective viewpoint, from the vantage point of the soul. So that's the absence of introspection. Instead of looking at what our mind's doing, we kind of get sunk in the mind and looking at what everyone else is doing. Then, three, attachment to the material identity. I am meditating. <laughs> really, you don't chant the mantra. The mantra appears by itself. You experience, if you think, I am meditating, you're already wrong, okay? So, false identification. So, the fourth one, the conception of being the doer. I am doing everything. I'm doing it now. Here we go. <laughs> yeah. So, you just, you're already setting out on the wrong foot. Because the whole attitude to the practice is just a bundle of ego. Okay? Then, the next one. Mm. Restlessness. Restless, that means, okay. okay. But then after about five minutes, I think, ah, oh, let me just get up and go outside. You know? And you get restless, you get fidgety. Because really, if you want to go deeply, then you have to spend some time. Anything that's valuable requires some investment. And this is really the most valuable thing. Enlightenment perfection of life. So it requires some investment. Huh? But we get restless. So then, uh, restlessness of the body, and then impatience. Okay, you may be sitting there, but in your mind, you're meditating. Okay, when is this some experience going to come? Hmm? So that's, that impatience, mental impatience, is a kind of agitation. In other words, you're trying to make the mind become calm, but you're becoming more agitated that you're not becoming calm fast enough. <laughs> right? <laughs> These are the traps that people come in. Um, then seven, the seventh one. The next one is a material conception of the mantra. I've moved away from you now. What are you doing? You're saying a mantra. So you're saying the mantra, but you might be thinking, yeah, this is just some words. I'm speaking some words. It's just a name, you know. I could, I could say any name. You know, I could say Coca-Cola, 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 <laughs> whatever. Yeah? So we may have a material conception of the mantra, but the mantra given by Guru is a living mantra. It's the aprakta pran, supernatural pran, that will take over our mind and deliver our soul from illusion. So don't have the material conception of the mantra. Next one. Mm -hmm. Miscategorization of transcendence. That means that a lot of people say, can you show me God? And the answer is actually yes. But it cannot be shown to your senses because God is not a sense object. You see? Your senses, your eye can only see shape and color. Because that's the category that the eye is related to. Your ear can only hear sound. Your skin can only feel temperature. You see? Can you tell how hot the room is with your ear? No. Because the object of the ear is in a completely different category. You see? So can you show me God? People ask, but they make a category mistake. They think that God is a sense object. Something accessible through the eye. The, the material eye, the material ear, the material skin or something. No, God is transcendental and cannot be accessed through material instruments. But he can be accessed. He reflects his beautiful form on the pure consciousness when you go into trance. So you can see God in Samadhi. In trance you can see God. But you cannot see God by this lump of jelly here. This eyeball. Hmm? So, the miscategorization of transcendence. The next one. Indifference to chanting. Let's say Guru tells you, you should chant 25,000 names every day. 
So then you kind of do it. But why you're just doing it to, you know, check it off that you did it. But while you were doing it, you were thinking of something else. So you're kind of indifferent to the mantra. No. Mantra is a person. Mantra is a supreme, beautiful person. Yeah. If some very famous person, if Leonardo DiCaprio walked in the room now, right? Then what would you do? Take a picture. Right, okay. <laughs> you take a selfie. Very honest. You probably wouldn't do that. You'd probably say, who is this guy? Just sit down and listen to the class. Because I can see you're actually absorbed in what we're saying. It's much more important than a selfie with Leonardo DiCaprio. <laughs> well, I didn't, you know, she's not a plant. I didn't plant her in the audience to make this class better. Krishna arranged it. So, yeah. So, yeah, so if a very important or famous person comes, our attention goes there. We're not indifferent. So, in the same way, when the mantra is coming, yeah, should not be indifferent. So, then, next one complacency. Becoming lazy. Next one. Hmm? Indulgence in imagination. Don't get carried away. Oh yeah. I heard that uh, Krishna plays a flute. He's decorated with a peacock feather. And he's dancing in the forest of Vrindavan. And, and I'm already there. I'm with him. I'm in my spiritual form. And, and we're doing all this great stuff together. Don't start speculating. That will come, but don't try to create it with your mind. It has to be real, real. And if you try to create things by your speculation imagination, you're actually delaying your progress to the state of Samadhi, because this imagination potentially calls it Vikalpa, Vikalpa, and it's one of the passionate vrittis of the intelligence. You know, Praman, Viparye, uh, Smriti, Nidra, and Vikalpa, the five bridges of the Bhutti. So don't get too carried away with imagination. Try to hear the mantra and, and be absorbed and offer yourself in devotion. So yeah, okay, don't speculate. Next one. Mm. Emotional disconnection. Sometimes we may meditate, but we're not feeling emotionally involved. Mm. How can we overcome that? Then, ah, very interesting. Number 14, the spirit of independence. You see, reality is one, in one sense. But it means that there's no duality. There's varieties in the spiritual world, but they're all of a spiritual nature. They're all Satchidananda. Eternal, eternal, Sat, Chit, conscious, and Ananda, full of joy. So the spiritual variety of Satchidananda. But that is one reality filled with the eternity, knowledge, and bliss. But we have what is called Pratak Drisha. That means a vision of separation. I am separate from God. I have my own separate life. I'm doing my own thing like this. This spirit of independence stops us from feeling or becoming aware of our oneness in love with Krishna. So that's called the Swatantra Drishti, independent vision or Pratak Drishti, the mental mm, projection that everything is separate, when actually everything is connected. Then the last one, impersonalism. Impersonalism is just to not treat the Supreme Being like a person. Reality is a person with feelings. So we have to deal with the Supreme Consciousness in a very personal way. So these are 15 impediments to a person when they sit down and they take their mala and they're about to go and they're just like buried in all of these things and can't get out. So you have to become free from them. So in order to solve, there are 10 solutions. These 10 solutions will solve these 15 problems. And I collected these 10 solutions and put them in one 
Sanskrit verse. Just one. It's short, like a Gita verse. Shakshikala Tata Drishya Nutapam Jivanasam Dohi Vastu Shakti Dukantena Prabhu Dasam Nama Prabhu. It's very short. So, just like a pill. So that's why this book is called First Aid for Chanting. <laughs> just like you, you, you're sick or something, you just you take a pill or something. It's like a pill. Just take this first aid and you'll overcome all these obstacles just in a few moments and you're free to go deeply into your meditation. So, don't take the blue pill. Don't take the red pill. Hmm? Take the Krishna pill. Hmm? Let me see. So we're, we're running out of time. You can come if you want to get one of these. You can get one and take it home. Otherwise, you can send me your email address and I'll send you the PDF for free. For free. Hmm? So if you want to have the book, read it. It looks nice. It feels like you can. <laughs> uh, otherwise, I'll send it to you for free. Uh, because this is another thing also about the spiritual path. The true teacher on the spiritual path doesn't charge any money. No money. Hmm? Nothing. So, you can come and get one of these. We're going to have one more care time. Afterwards, you can come and get a book. They're like $10, just to book and keep printing them. And if you don't have 10 bucks, no problem, just give me your email address, okay? And I'll send it to you.